Hey, hey, party people. This video is going to focus on instructions, tips, and tricks on how to use gouache in an opaque way. Those of you who follow my channel probably already know that I like to use gouache and I use different amounts of water to manipulate different effects. And I will often water it down a lot and use it more like a traditional watercolor. But in this video, I want to talk about using it as thickly, as undiluted as possible to make it opaque. You know, this lineup, it uses both diluted and undiluted gouache. This illustration uses mainly undiluted really as straight from the tube as possible gouache. And even if you don't like the look of an entirely opaque gouache illustration, learning how to work with it is a really good set of skills to learn for all kinds of texture renderings like sequins, beading, embroidery, chunky knits, all kinds of stuff. And it really helps you figure out darker skin tones. Okay, because you know, if you take a really dark brown and you try to dilute it to work it like a watercolor, it often doesn't look great, okay? It takes a bit more opacity to make darker skin tones look really great. And so you also want to practice the opaque gouache techniques as well. Let's start off by going over the materials I like, okay? So here are three gouache brands that I have used and like. Windsor & Newton, I've been, this is the first gouache I ever used. I use these college onward, still love them. This is a brand called Knicker, and this is new to me. I bought this in Japan two years ago, and I love these. And this third one, Pabeo, I bought these for the first time in Tel Aviv a few years ago, and I enjoy these. Holbein, I feel like I like them, I don't love them. I hold on to them because I would like to try them again now that I've tried a bunch of other brands that I like in between then and now. This Talon's Opaque Watercolor Jury is still out. I'm still playing with these as well as the Linnell I bought, Linnell, Lionel, Linnell, whatever. I bought these in, um, where did I buy these? Oh, I bought these in London. And I've only tried them a few times, so jury's still out. And the Mamery, ah, so far I don't love them. But I'm going to keep using them, uh, give it a little bit more time. Those of you who watch my Karen Dosh gouache review know that those were a big fail. I don't even know where they are anymore. Let's talk about brushes. Now, when I am watercoloring in different dilutions, I typically like to use rounds. So this is a round shape. This is another. These two are a couple of my favorites. This is the Escoto Reserva Kolinsky Sable that is just magnificent. This is my trusty Princeton synthetic round I've had for 80, 100 years. 80, 100. It's a real number, but for opaque gouache, I prefer flatter, shorter haired, shorter bristled brushes. This is a filbert. It's flat and it has a soft edge. This one is very flat with a very crisp edge. And here is a very narrow, sharp, short bristle, flat shader. This is one of my favorites for opaque wash work. And yeah, you know, I'll do the details in the smaller round brushes, but I prefer the flat brushes for this kind of thing. And this one and this one, these are synthetic. These are lint-free wiping cloths that I use instead of paper towels. And uh, when I am painting with opaque wash, I I do a lot of dry brush blending techniques that you'll see later in this video. And so I'm wiping my brush off quite a bit. So I like to keep these handy. These are toothbrushes, just ordinary toothbrushes from the grocery store. And when I am mixing thicker paints, 
like the opaque wash, which comes out like toothpaste, and then just trying to water it down a little bit, it's easier to use something like a toothpick to mix them than like mangling your brush in there. Okay, this is gum arabic it's a watercolor medium and if you're going to use it i recommend that you use this liquid version there are also these gum arabic pastes but the goal is to just thin out the gouache just a little bit this does not help with the thinning and so use this for other stuff Here's some tests I did with the glycerin and the gouache binder. And I have found that the gum arabic looks nice. It's the second column on each, okay? The gum arabic makes the color richer. It keeps the opacity. It looks good. Water works just fine. Don't worry about it, okay? The glycerin, it looks okay but it seriously takes so long to dry. I painted the glycerin, I went and had lunch in my kitchen, I came back, it was still wet. This is gouache binder, it's a schminky one. This is the glycerin I use, and many people will mix in a little bit of glycerin in with their gouache, in a traveling watercolor kit so that the gouache doesn't crack, and I have found that it is useful for that, but in terms of painting with it, not so much. This is a schminky gouache binder, and what I originally bought this for was to mix up my powder pigments and turn them into, you know, actual paints. So I tested it with the regular gouache, and mm, there's nothing special about it where I'm like, oh, you should use this instead. It's just whatever, you know. Let's talk about paper. When I am painting with opaque gouache, nine times out of 10, I am using a colored paper so that I can make an all white or mostly white outfit really pop off the page. Even when I'm doing something digitally, I'll drop a background so you can really see that white come out. This is a Canson paper I can't pronounce it, so I'm just gonna throw it up on the screen. <laughs> and uh, it's about 90 pounds, which is much lighter than my preferred 140 pound paper. But that's okay because opaque wash uses so much less water that it's okay that the paper be thinner because I don't need the thick paper to you know, absorb water and work with it and all those things for traditional watercoloring methods. It does have a slight tooth. Okay, some of that you're seeing is kind of the greeniness of the color. And these papers, they come in with a slight green or also really smooth, uh, no heathering in the color, but all the papers do have this slight texture. This is a paper from Camford and it is typically for drawing with dry media. But again, since the opaque wash takes such so much less liquid that I found that I can paint on it and get good results. You'll see that in a minute. I actually do the demo on this paper. If you are going to use regular white watercolor paper for your opaque wash renderings, think about how textured you want your paper to be. Because when you're trying to pull the paint across the page, because it's so much thicker, it's gonna drag more. This is a Bockingford cold press. And when you have a textured paper like this, it's gonna be harder to drag across and you're gonna have to thin it out just a hair more to work with it. This is the Bockingford hot press and look how smooth it is. And so, yeah, this is painted really poorly but it's really easy to pull that paint across. Something to think about with opaque gouache. This is Arches cold press paper. It is top three favorite papers for me to work on. However, look at all that texture. Normally, I love all this texture, but for opaque gouache, forget it. Like dragging that paste through, <laughs> it's just not fun. Not fun at all, not really. You could use the Arches hot press. That paper is really good too. One more note about the colored papers. Now, whether it's camphor paper or the Canson paper, 
If you do the traditional kind of using a croquis template, putting your paper on top and using a light box to draw your initial sketch using your template, you want to make sure you pick a color that you can still see through. This red is too dark and I it's either going to be so hard to see or you can't see it at all. These papers are great because they're light enough that you can still see the template through the paper. You're going to have to be in a darker room than usual, but you will still see through it. The trick about painting opaque gouache is to get the right consistency of the gouache. You want it thick enough so that it's opaque and you get the same color whether you paint it on white paper or gray paper but you want it thin enough that you can pull it across the paper and not get it too brushy or textured or patchy. And you know, when you're an illustrator or a painter, fine art painter, and you're working with gouache and you want the texture, that's one thing. But if you are a fashion illustrator or trying to do something specific, you wanna control the texture. Like if you're a rendering skin, uh, in a fashion illustration, you probably don't want a hairy, brushy texture. You know, this is actually quite difficult, so don't despair if you don't get it on the first or tenth try. People who took a classic color theory class back in the day may remember spending hours and hours making the perfect gouache color chips and value scales, or maybe you've blocked those traumatic memories from your mind. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no formula I can give you for how much water or watercolor medium to add to get the right consistency because not only are the paints different thicknesses brand to brand, but color to color. So even within the same brand, some colors will be thicker than others. Now, when I'm painting with watercolor, I will typically use a slightly more opaque watercolor to get my shadow color. That's what I do most often. But you can't exactly do that with opaque gouache because it's already as opaque as it's gonna get, right? So you have to deliberately mix a shadow color. And what I like to do is use the complement. And in this case, I am using a green, which is the complement of red to create the shadow colors. I rarely use black. I use black when the original color is so dark, like if I'm trying to shade a very dark blue. And I find using the complement creates a more attractive, natural shadow than black. Black is not, I mean, you should try for yourself and see what you like better, but I much prefer using the complement. So if I'm shading yellow, add a touch of purple. And yeah, purple is very dark and yellow is not, so you wanna make sure you're adding just a little bit. And if you are shading purple, adding yellow is not really gonna do a whole lot because yellow is so light, and so I would use a mustard color, which is, has that golden tone, but it's darker and duller, and creates nice shadows. When I'm shading, what I like to do is lay down my shadow color when my base color is still a little bit damp. And then I like to take a clean, dry brush and soften the edges of my shadow. So you can use a secondary brush and kept clean and dry for this purpose, or you can use uh, the cloth I have in the corner there and I'll wipe your brush off and use that clean dry brush to soften the edges of the shadow. And of course, if you like a more graphic look, you can keep the clean edges of a shadow if that's more your jam. When you mix your shadow color, you want to make sure that that paint is also pretty opaque. Even if you can get away with it technically by having a more watery, darker color on top, in my experience, it warps the color underneath, it starts picking up the gouache underneath, starts mixing it unattractively, 
if you put a watery gouache on top of a dry base color, it'll kind of sit in a really weird streaky way. And so I have found most success with making sure that whatever shadow colors I put on top of the base color is as opaque as possible. So that it just sits on the, the base layer instead of trying to interact with it too much. And then I soften the edges with the clean dry brush. And I use the same approach with highlight. I pick my highlight color. In this case, I chose white because I do want it to eventually develop a very bright highlight, lay down the white, make sure it's opaque, and then soften the edges with a cleaner brush. And you know, if you need more intense highlight, more shadow, just layer them on top. You don't need to try to get it all in one go, okay? You can layer, blend, soften things out, you know, add a little bit more paint where you need to, soften things out, okay? Work slowly and carefully in that way because opaque gouache is less forgiving than watercolor it's you know when it hits the paper it's really there like you know there are a couple of like things you can fudge with watercolor where you can pick things up and like kind of sponge them out not so much with the opaque gouache <laughs> funny story about this sketch i was actually looking for something else and i found this sketch and it's drawn on canford paper uh, I have no recollection at all whatsoever of drawing this. It is obviously my drawing. It's definitely in my style, in my line quality, but I have no idea when I did it. <laughs> I have no idea when I did it, why I did it, no clue whatsoever. So I kept it for a rainy day and here's today's rainy day and it's perfect for this opaque wash tutorial. So here we go. Now, as I mentioned, when I like to do uh, majority or all white outfits, I like to use the color paper and use opaque white gouache to make it pop. I am using a test paper that is identical to my painting paper to make sure the color comes out that it's as opaque as I want it to be. So always have testing paper. I have that testing paper under my hand so I don't smear the pencil too much while I'm painting on the left hand side. When you are painting with opaque wash, keep in mind that if it's opaque enough, which is the goal, you're gonna lose your pencil lines, okay? Notice how I'm covering up my side seams and the buttons of those pants? When you're painting, keep in mind, only cover up the lines where you are confident you will be able to freehand draw them later on. I'm leaving that center front there for my own reference. And I, mean, I, I can draw it later on, but it is a good reference point for how her body is twisting. And kind of, I will be taking it from there. I will be putting in my wrinkles and my buttons and my pockets and everything, starting with that center front line as my reference point. So I'm leaving that there. So paint around the lines that you need, and then you can cover up things that you can draw in later on. Here's my favorite trick for getting a smooth, flat layer of opaque wash. Because it's very thick and pasty and you're going to see some of that brushy texture trying to get it opaque enough, especially when you're working with light colors like white and yellow that are going to just be less opaque than say red or blue. I like to leave that there, that thick paint, and then I'll go in with the second layer of white of the same color but a little bit more watered down and use that to just smooth everything out smooth that texture out fill in some rough patches some more texture patches you're gonna smooth all that out and just give it a glossy polish really with a more watery white on top and so if you want to do that make sure that you transfer some of your original color into another well on your palette, put a little bit of water in, and then you can put in that second layer and just kind of smooth everything out before you move on to shadowing. When I am shadowing white, there are a lot of options, okay? Because 
most of y'all know there are a lot of whites. There are winter whites, there are summer whites, there are creamy whites, there are cool whites, warm whites. There are a lot of different whites out there. And you can really emphasize a mood and a look you're going for by what kind of shadow you use. And I wanted this kind of like cool khaki vibe to go with the cool kind of French gray paper and this kind of like sort of 70s badass pose and outfit she has going on. So instead of using black, which again, I rarely shadow with, I am using this very cool, cool tone brown. It's that Toledo brown in uh, that new gouache I bought. And so I'm working those shadows and creating a particular look with my shadow color. Something I always do when I'm working with watercolor, whether it's opaque like this or not, is to skip a section when I am painting. So I'm not gonna paint what's next to the white right now. I'm gonna give it a minute to set and dry. I'm going to paint this bra top next. And I am using that cool tone brown that I use to shadow the pants to give that, uh, that outfit some cohesiveness. And in this case, I am shading with a touch of black mixed in with that cool brown olive color because I didn't want to add the complement, which is a red. I didn't want to add any warmth. I wanted it to keep, I wanted to deaden the color. That's what black shadows do. They deaden the color. And I wanted that. I wanted it cool and a little bit toned down. Now that I've killed some time fussing with her hair and her sunglasses, let's approach the skin color. First of all, when I am painting on camera, <laughs> I have to work really hard to not uh, move my head in front of the overhead camera. <laughs> and so I can't get my face really close to the paper to like pay attention. And so I end up moving the paper closer to my face to get the right angle to see closely. And that's why I keep moving the paper around. Number two, you know, I am of that camp where don't stress your arm. Move the paper around if that's what you need to get the right line, to get the right application of color. I'm really all about the end result when it comes to like that. I'm not a super snob about technique. Right? Back to skin tone. I prefer to paint darker skin tones, medium to dark skin tones, when I'm working with opaque wash. Tons of reasons. Number one, it's actually easier. <laughs> because I'll tell you, getting lighter skin tones in opaque wash that doesn't look like cheap foundation is a little bit difficult, not gonna lie. It's possible, but you know, I just often don't like it. I don't. And yeah, I'm shading with black because her skin tone is already so dark that you can barely tell. Yeah. But, you know, this is just straight up burnt umber. I think it's a great skin tone. And even when I am painting more watercolor, watery paint style, my skin tones, when I paint them darker, are more opaque, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. I think it looks nice. I think it looks great. The kind of, When you are doing lighter skin tones in opaque wash, you do have to use things like white or Naples yellow as the base, and it can kind of look chalky and it's, it's funny because when it's in a fabric like these pants, they just look like white pants, right? But there's something about it having applied to the skin where it just has that makeup-y look. Max Factor pancake makeup from the 50s, like that kind of look, right? So yeah, I just prefer darker skin tones for this sort of look. I do have a whole video on how to mix skin tones. So if you do want to have lighter skin tones for your opaque wash, you can still use the same methods, you know, using a burnt sienna and mixing in a little bit of a cool tone to kind of chill out the oranginess of the burnt sienna, you know, things like that that I mentioned in the skin tones video, but apply those colors to a white base 
it's still the same. If you watched my hair rendering series, I have a whole playlist. Funnily enough, it's called hair. And in those videos, I mean, I don't have a watercolor paint video. Let me know in the comments if you want one. But the rules are the same. Find your highlight, find your shadows where hair is darkest, where hair is lightest, where it catches the light. Always render in the direction that the hair is flowing, blowing, growing, all those good things. And in this case, you know, you work with that brushy texture of the opaque wash to give you that hair texture. And just take advantage of that. It really works. And then the number one rule of working with dry media is to make sure that your paint is 721% dry before you start any kind of color pencil, pencil work on top. Otherwise, you're just going to start carving grooves into your paint and not actually apply any of the color of the pencil onto your paper. Good times, right? Mm. And that's about it, you know. Uh, drop me all your questions in the comments section below. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today. And share, subscribe, and you know, you know the big P word, practice. Hashtag always be practicing. Hashtag practice not magic. Hashtag if your first one sucks, you're right on track. Hashtag it's hard because it's hard, not because there's anything wrong with you. And I will see you in the next video.